there we go. I'm intimidating. <laughs> it's like, there's no women on the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's castrating bitches. <laughs> so um, welcome to Good Vibrations, Hacking Motion Sickness on the Cheap. I am Totenkopf. Um, you will usually see that avatar associated with my screen name. Um, so yeah, a little background on myself. I grew up in the um, IT department of my dad's work. Every day off from school, I would spend there working on computers and networks and servers. Um, similar, is it gonna work? There you go. Similar to these, but it was a little bit messier. And um, yeah, so anyways, um, then last year, my dad dared me to hack one of these um, digital billboards and I spoke actually spoke on this last year at DEF CON and it was responsible it's unofficially responsible for my losing my uh, last job because <laughs> um, Clear Channel doesn't like it um, so somewhere between computers and billboards I started having conversations with Neon Rain and a bend and um, we started talking about neurohacking or using technology to improve processes um, involving your brain and body. And of course, uh, my mind went to um, the brain that wouldn't die. Because <laughs> I'm like, sweet, I get to put someone on a table and hook them up to wires and such, similar to Tiger right next to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, just to let you know, I have um, little to no medical background. Um, <laughs> but I do have access to um, extensive medical resources. <laughs> so the idea behind this um, talk started when my friend Amanda and I went to go see a really, really bad horror movie. Um, the camera kept shaking really badly and it wasn't even 15 minutes into the movie before she had to leave the theater because she was getting sick. So we started talking about um, what caused motion sickness and how it can be stopped. And we thought it was ridiculous that there was no cure or fix for motion sickness, even though it's been around for um, ages. Um, currently there are pills, but I don't think that a pill is a good enough fix. Um, there's no universally accepted definition for motion sickness. It's usually um, defined by the signs and symptoms present when you experience it. These include nausea, vertigo, fatigue, pale, clammy skin, increased elevation, and hyperventilation, even though this is also associated with um, men seeing women at DEF CON. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, motion sickness first occurred, or they assume it first occurred, when man tried to improve natural mobility. Um, we believe this is when we started using um, animals such as horses and camels, or uh, using rafts and boats. The first recorded incident of motion sickness occurred in ancient Greece, um, it happened on the water, and they coined the term nausea, nos being um, of or related to water, and um, the suffix ia, meaning um, illness. So illness on the water makes sense. Um, so now some time for some statistics, yay, math. 90% um, of the world's population suffer from motion sickness at least once in their lives. Um, 300 million people in the U.S. roughly experience it. Um, 9 to 75 million of those have a debilitating response, meaning um, they're immobilized by the signs and symptoms of motion sickness. And 2 million of these people have to visit a doctor to be prescribed something. Um, some people feel the um, effects of motion sickness worse than others. Um, there's been a recent study that shows a genetic pre uh, predisposition to motion sickness. Um, inherited by either your mother or father. Some races feel it worse than others. I found that um, African Americans and Asians are more likely to suffer from motion sickness than Caucasians. Um, others with increased, sus blah, increased susceptibility to it include pregnant women, 
frequent migraine sufferers, and people with anxiety disorders. Um, there are different kind, types of uh, motion sickness, and um, those are characterized by where they occur, which is um, in an automobile, you know, train or a bus, on a plane, while playing video games, or on a boat. <laughs> um, now, you would think with all of these people suffering from motion sickness, scientists and um, doctors would spend more time studying um, what causes it, and they would know um, how to fix it. But they don't. So, um, as a matter of fact, there have been several um, theories of causation um, starting back from ancient Greece and going to today. Um, we're first going to discuss um, the disproven theories, which, um, come on, include the blood and guts theory. They thought that, um, at first they thought that motion sickness was a result of a blood disease and um, thinning of your blood from being on the water or on a camel upset your stomach and that's why you got motion sickness. Well, they were wrong. Respiratory issues, they assumed that it had something to do with the lungs or your heart. Um, then after that was rejected, it went to a reaction to shock to the central nervous system and or the um, atomic nervous system. Uh, once, once that was rejected, they thought it was an infection similar to cholera or yellow fever. And then they're like, well, maybe the person's just moving too much and they're getting sick. So um, the, the overstimulation is the most recent rejected theory, and that was in the mid-60s. And now they're going for something called foveal slip, which we'll discuss right now. Foveal slip is, a, it relates to um, fixation disparity. Okay, how do I explain this? Okay. Fixation disparity is um, when your retina and your phobia have moved over time due to watching TV or reading a book in the dark, staring at your computer for too long, and your phobia moves actually inside of your eye a few, um, a few degrees, and this leads to a lack of visual acuity. It occur uh, there's a misalignment in the eye, one eye has these um, a moved fovea more so than the other. It can be horizontal and or vertical, and it results in over or under convergence of the eyes at the fixation point. The misalignment of the fovea is only a few arc minutes, which is 1 60th of a degree, and it eventually leads to depth perception problems. So unfortunately, as hackers and um, IT security folk who sit in front of the computer all day, we are more likely to suffer from motion sickness than normal folks. Okay, so here's a picture of the eye. If you look, there's um, the fovea right there. Now, this is where it's supposed to be, but over time, it moves up towards the retina or down towards the uh, blind spot and optic nerve. It leaves, uh, it leaves people unable to track motion accurately with their eyes. There's a definite correlation between foveal slip and motion sickness. Um, a group in Oxford found out that it occurs during optokinetic stimulation, um, eye movement basically. Increased fixation disparity leads to increased foveal slip, which leads to worse manifestations of motion sickness. Another theory that's going on right now, um, going around right now and has not been disproven, is the motor sensory conflict theory. Um, what it states basically is that um, it's a defense mechanism for your, uh, utilized by your brain to protect against neurotoxins. It occurs when signals from your, um, signals sent to your brain from your eyes disagree with signals sent to your brain from your inner ear. So say if you're watching a movie and your eyes sense movement on the screen, but your inner ear says, no, I'm sitting down in a chair, your brain goes, oh, you're hallucinating, time for you to throw up now. <laughs> or when you're in a car reading a book, your inner ear says you're moving and your eyes say, no, I'm, I'm just sitting here reading a book. Oh, your eyes are lying, it's time for you to throw up now. It's upset because your body cannot um, sustain homeostasis. 
um, here's your um, semicircular canals. That's part of your vestibular system right inside of your ear. <clears throat> it consists of the semicircular canals, which is responsible for uh, balance and sense of spatial orientation. Movement of your head causes fluid to move from the um, endolymphatic sac, which is, there it is, right here, to push against the cupula, which is this thing right here, which has hairs that translates mechanical movement into electrical signals, which is sent to your brain. <clears throat> when the eye sense movements, uh, wait, yeah, I already explained that. So now that we're going into current prevention techniques and treatment. Prevention me methods include sit where motion is felt the least, don't read, keep your head and body still, face forward in a reclining position, keep eyes on the horizon, keep window open, don't drink or smoke, and eat small, low-fat, bland, and starchy foods. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't do most, if any, of those when I'm about to go on a long trip, especially on the plane from Florida to Vegas. So that just doesn't work for me. So I have to go, to, um, I can either go to the natural remedies, which include powder or liquid ginger, the use of acupuncture, acupressure, or mild electrical shock to either the pericardium, which is um, three finger widths below your wrist, which is like right there, or the small intestine 17, just which is located just below the ear lobes in the indentations behind the jawbone. If you guys pass, uh, that is a pressure point also, so don't press on it too long. You'll pass out and I'll feel bad. <laughs> so, okay, time to discuss drugs. Woo, drugs. Not the fun kind though. Um, <laughs> dip in hydramine is the active ingredient in sleep aids. Um, you can't use it if you're an infant. It's not good for the elderly, pregnant, or breastfeeders, or people with glaucoma, heart disease, constipation, or enlarged prostate. So it's, and also it makes you sleepy because as is, pretty ob is made pretty obvious since it's the main ingredient in sleep aids. Um, there's also antihistamines being used. It's most effective when taking 30 to 60 minutes before a trip. It, less, it makes you drowsy and less alert, and it shouldn't be used by people with emphysema or bronchitis. So after finding all this out, I'm like, well, that's kind of lame. And so part of the neurohacking thing is that we like to apply technology into trying to fix things. So it's time for me to present Das Goods. Um, the first one I actually don't have with me, it's called an aura oscillator. It uses um, a program made in pure data to produce a signal in the 0 0.01 to 10 kilohertz range, which um, was chosen because that's the range for typical head movements, such as shaking your head, nodding it up and down. Um, it works using the motor sensory theory as a basis. Basically, if you are sitting, playing a video game, and you, your eyes sense movement, and you start feeling motion sickness, theoretically you can put this thing against your, um, the bone in your head and it'll stimulate inner ear vibrations which should stop um, motion sickness, the onset of the symptoms or making them um, not as severe. By the, I don't have it with me today, um, I don't have the code up yet, but by the end of the day I'll have, it, uh, I'll have the code available here uh, totenkoff.com slash strobe.txt and the next device I actually have on Tiger um, they're called stroboscopic glasses they're, um, LEDs are mounted just outside the wearer's peripheral vision lights flash at 20 hertz with 8 millisecond dwell time it prevents your eyes from going into foveal slip and could theoretically cause epileptic seizures, but it shouldn't. <laughs> so since, since this is uh, DEF CON, my um, device has decided that it doesn't want to work. 
So she's she's modeling it for me anyways. Okay, so yeah, Tiger, can you stand up for me? All right, so she's wearing the basically what we have here, the material list. Okay, come on, get rid of the seizure warning. Material list, okay. So there's this cheap sunglasses found at, uh, for a dollar at the dollar store. The hat, which I found at the bottom of the closet. I think it was my little sister's or something. We have a lily pad Arduino right here. And then we bought the e-sewing kit. Now, the LEDs are mounted right here. And theoretically, you won't have the crocodile wires right there. So, <laughs> um, so they flash right uh, they flash right outside your peripheral vision, so you only see the flash, but you don't see the actual LED. So that's supposed because I, uh, from what I've read, are you okay? Okay, from what I've read, don't work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tiger. <laughs> from what I read, if it was within your peripheral vision, then you are more likely to suffer from an epileptic seizure while it's flashing. So don't do that. Um, by the end of the day, okay, that's all I have. By the end of the day, you should have, I should have all the stuff up on totenkoff.com. And um, you can follow me on Twitter as at totenkoff. And yes, I misspelled it on purpose. I know. That's it. Yay. <laughs>